Welcome to this episode of the Structural Engineering Channel, a podcast focused on helping structural engineering professionals stay up to date on technical trends in the field and to help them succeed in their careers and lives. In this episode, we are talking to Scott Collins, PESE Principal at Collins Structural Consulting's PLLC about first and second responding structural engineers and some of the large scale disaster projects he has worked on. I'm your co-host, Matt Cardle. And I'm your co-host, Kara Green. Now let's jump into our conversation of the week with Scott. This episode of the Structural Engineering Channel is brought to you by PPI, a leader in engineering exam prep for the PE Structural Exam. PPI provides expert prep courses and study resources designed to help you pass the PE Structural Exam the first time. PPI's PE Structural course is fully updated and taught with October 2021 code references and includes new editions of their PE Structural books. PPI's live online courses include hours of lectures, problem solving demonstrations, exam strategy sessions, office hours, and a passing guarantee. When you take a live online course, PPI guarantees you will pass or you can take the on-demand course for free. PPI has helped engineers achieve their licensing goals since 1975. Check out PPI today at PPI, the number two, pass.com to see all of the resources available for PE structural exam prep. Again, that's PPI, the number two, P-A-S-S dot com. Scott, first, welcome to the show. We're so happy to have you on. So in your own words, can you tell us a little bit more about yourself and the type of work that you do? Yes, I'm a structural engineer. I graduated 1999 from UNC Charlotte. I have moved around and worked in big firms, little firms from 125 person structural engineering firms to AE firms, architectural engineering firms to three person firms. Uh, I own my own firm, started in 2009 after the great pop and had clients that wanted to work for me and started the business because it was that or find another career path. As progressed through my company in 2011, Raleigh got hit with a bunch of tornadoes and I got called in to start doing post-disaster work. Post-disaster work led into a little side venture that I do on my own, which is I'm uh, one of probably 200, 300 structural engineers that are first responders. So I am a STS2. I work with the North Carolina Emergency Management on the state level. Uh, There are people working on the federal levels and city levels. In the, in the world. So. Scott, could you uh, talk about that a little more for particularly the structural engineers and even the students that don't really know what first and second responders are and what's the difference uh, between that and what do they do? So each stage, there's three stages in a disaster. The first stage is human life issues. We're working at recovering people mostly. So to do that, that's dealing with usually firefighters make up most of the teams, but on a federal level and a state level, we have uh, different classification teams, but at least two engineers are assigned with an 80 person team and they go downrange. In fact, we usually get positioned prior to the storm or event happening. If it's an earth, like a tornado, if it's an earthquake, it's obviously always after the fact, but if we know the events coming, we'll stage prior downrange jillfully just outside the event so that as soon as the event crosses, we can get right into it. Secondary responders is about the buildings. How do we get the people back into their structures safely? What's needed to get in there? And then the third one is releasing those structures to get repaired and it becomes a recovery stage. So my firm does probably a third of its work in the recovery world, but we also do secondary responders and first responders. At least I do the first responder section. Yeah, and just a, a quick follow up because I, you know, it's it. I think it's very interesting. Um, I think you know it's always interesting to, it's interesting but unfortunate that you know we we do have quite a few natural disasters that happen all across the United States, Canada, and the world. You know, is that to become a first responder? Is that something that like you get sourced out to do, or is that I know um, like ASCE has something where they have almost like a first responder, I don't know, roster or something like that. 
SCA has a uh, secondary responders. It's called the SEER program. Mm -hmm. uh, SEER program is like looking for engineers, uh, EIs even, to get volunteer, to get some training. There's a, an all-day course. It's now web-based or online that uh, allows an engineer to go in with the building departments to determine if the building is habitable or not. And that's the second level of the vents. So it's usually deemed safe enough to get into the area. You're not rescuing people. Any you know fatalities have been retrieved and recovered. So you're going in there to evaluate just the buildings. Mm -hmm. You know, is this building okay? Can I have someone live in this? And you give it a stoplight. You give it a, a red, don't go in it. Yellow, someone needs to come back and evaluate this a little more. And a green, it's fine. Go ahead and live in it, occupy it, use it. So that's the SEER program. And like I said, it's a great program. Uh, so that's easy for everyone to get into and you can start early on and young because what they'll do is they'll give you different levels and as a younger engineer you get paired with a more senior engineer to go out there and survey it mm -hmm. you get about 20 mi minutes per building trying to figure out if it's habitable or not trying to cover a large area event yeah so. that's really cool um especially i i find your job very interesting obviously <laughs> um but i've lived in places where we've had floods and then i've also lived in places where they've had tornadoes so i've heard about the first second and third but never really knew how to get involved. Um, but can you talk to us a little bit about some of the large scale disaster projects that you've worked on and really what that entailed for you? Right, so on the first responder level, you know, I have done, I started this working with the state level at, in 2015. So our state is unique in the fact that we have 15 engineers tied with the North Carolina Emergency Management that allows us to be deployed. In fact, we're actually self-deployable. So we can respond from a small incident or like teaming up with a local fire department to a large scale incident. So some of the large scale incidents is like Florence in 2018 that came into North Carolina. Uh, I was tasked with the Tor North Carolina Task Force 8. And as we crossed into Laurenburg, it became an island. It was unpassable. We got onto this area of land that literally became 20 feet of water deep all the way around the whole general area. So during the event, our first initial distance is, okay, we need to put 80 people somewhere in this area. What's the best building to do it? So we're evaluating, you know, schools. We're trying to say, okay, well, can we stay in this school? Can we stay in this church? Well, this church is higher. And we're like, okay, this church is great, except for let's not put anybody by this big giant glass fall of windows so we, in case something breaks we don't want all the glass to come in on people so we are giving advice to the commander or the incident commander about where we wanted to how the building was, should be used for riding out a hurricane or yeah hurricane so in this case we actually got right in the path we got right over the eye so we got a nice calm spell and then right back to the wind our swift water teams hit the ground and they started going out in boats right away the Structural specialists were like, okay, we're going to be setting up camp. We're helping out the firefighters. We're cooking meals. We're we're doing whatever we can to help everybody else out because our expertise wasn't needed at the initial onset. In Florence, we were sitting there. Klaus and I, the other engineer, were sitting there going, okay, we're trying to help out. And then all of a sudden, we get told, you're going to go look at dams. And we're like, uh, okay, we can look at dams. We probably know more about a dam than anybody else on this side of the water. And they're like, well, the Army Corps guys can't get here, so you're it. So we went out to look at the first dam. It's like, okay, well, first dam, we got a couple of feet of water to, to breaching this one, so it's fine. We went to the second one, we're looking at that one, had to go ride a John Deere tractor because the water was so high to get to it. We get there, we're like, okay, well, yeah, all this water fits in that lower dam, so it's breaching, it's failing, it's going to break, but unless there's a reason we need to do it, there's no one in the way of it, so we're just going to let it go. So we gave our evaluations, the North Carolina management people said, okay, this is what you're doing and told us to evacuate the dam and let it go. So we did. Um, I helped quarterback Dorian as it came in in 2019. So I was communicating with all the other engineers that were out in the storm as they were going wide area searches, they were riding helicopters, they were doing you know, bird's eye views on the damage. I went to uh, Williamston, North Carolina to look at a small incident where a building was collapsed and they didn't think anybody was in it, but they wanted to make sure that the building was, you know, how bad of a damage was it going to be? And it wasn't going to fall into the road or damage other people, other people's properties because it was downtown. 
And I actually just got finished with a, a large scale exercise with the uh, Army 911 group, which is their first responders uh, two weeks ago, which was a 24 hour operation, three day event where they were breaching concrete and crawling through tunnels and dealing with shoring and dealing with lifting 800, 900 pound blocks of concrete off of dummies that were supposedly trapped by debris. So we are getting involved with, you know, lifting plans and tunneling and you know, coring and shoring. So it was a little more involved and fun, I guess, in a lot of ways. What's your procedure or so you're a first responder, I guess, how do you learn that? What What's your mindset and what's your process when you're going into these, these things? Well, we do, you know, first responding, there's actually two, two week, or two one week training courses in California. We actually have to fly out to San Francisco. And the first week is kind of like, it's it's a mixture of firefighters, army guys and engineers. So it's a little bit more like structures 101, going from what is a center of mass, how do you rig something to what a shoring is and what a shoring does. The next one is STS-2 and it's more of a, okay, here's a mock-up, here's a rubble pile where we have debris that you actually crawl through and try to figure out how much this weighs, how do you shore this, how do you map out the tunnels that you're making into the structure. So it's a little bit, a lot more hands-on in that. And it's definitely only for PEs on that level. So in SCS2, you have to have a PE, you have to have at least five years experience. And you kind of want to be, you know, you're going to want to be a little bit of a nut to want to go into a class building. Because the mindset on level one isn't is this building safe to go into? It's like, no, it's a disaster. It's not safe to go into. It's what is the safest way to get you and your team into the building? And by the way, you have 25 seconds to figure that out. Or you get to walk around the building and then tell us which way we're going in the building. You don't get a, let me break out a finite element model to determine which the best stress points to crack this nut. It's, this looks like the best place, you know, based on past experiences, past holes and stuff like that. So firefighters and, and army people know how to make holes in concrete. You're there to tell them where to make the holes in concrete. So it's a, definitely a different mindset from sitting here at the office, comfortably designing a nice, you know, brand new eight story <laughs> concrete structure or stuff. Yeah. I know in, uh, I've, I heard some talks where I, I think during the fires, there was a first responder that was uh, an engineer too. And, uh, Kind of like his procedure, yeah. It was it was a uh, on the spot decision making forensics, and uh, there was like one instance where it was okay. That's that's a old, unreinforced masonry building. Oh, but there's it was a tall wall, it was collapsed, no diaphragm, and there's heavy winds. Uh, you got to make the call. Yeah. It's things like that. It's uh, that's, yeah, that's like next level engineering, yeah. or that's that's really important because yeah, that's when it's most important to to help out yeah one of the side stories one of our older sts's was on a, a unreinforced masonry building with wood interior it was on fire and as he was doing a 360 walk around to figure out what's the best best way to get into it to start, you know help the firefighters out he comes across a couple guys smoking next to a, a white van really close to a ball and he looked at the wall and looked and said okay it's no interior floors anymore Hey guys, that's not a great place to be standing. If that building falls, that brick can land on you. So why don't you go smoke over by the tree? And you're like, okay, kind of sound like they weren't going to listen to him. So he goes or picks a corner, all of a sudden, boom, loud thing. He feels the vibrations. He runs around the corner and sees that wall just fell and that van's crushed. And he's looking at, oh my God, I got to call other people to get these firefighters out. They're right here. And he hears the voices going, Damn, that wall fell fast. And he turned around and said, you listened. <laughs> so he's like, okay, my, my job's done. <laughs> but he was like, just so relieved. It's like, you listened. Yes, you said not to be there. We didn't be there. So, you know, but that, that's one of his stories. He's like, look, sometimes you say stuff and it's easy to say that quickly. And the firefighters actually have learned, at least in our area, that the engineers are there to protect them. So they're not, you know, we're not out for egos. We're not trying to be the guy that knocks down the door. We're there to say, look, you're going in, got it. This is the best way to go in. And they can start listening to you when you do that. So they realize that you're there to protect them. And so when you go in together, they're like, look, you've not been in this situation inside with building, you know, falling around your ears, but you know, to look out. For, I know to look out for them and they know to look out for me. So we, as a team, we kind of try to do the best we can quickly. 
And you know, we try to make decisions like, okay, is that going to be a five minute rescue? Then let's go get get it done and get out of there. If it's going to be, you know, I got to pull two levels of concrete off to get that person out. I got to short. We got to start looking at long term instances. Do we have hanging debris? Do we have uh, shifting capabilities? Are we going to have, you know, just because the building is not moving, does that mean it's stable? Because you have a pile of rubble and you have an aftershock. Well, that rubble becomes marbles and that floor plate that's leaning at a 45 may become a, a rolling disc and becomes flat and you could crush a whole bunch of people. So like, you know, we got a shore, you know, if we got to get somebody out, it may be a shoring requirement, how much shoring, how type of, what type of shoring. So that's where we start to shine is figuring out, you know, what's our duration of it. And then when it becomes really bad and you're like, realize that it's going from a rescue to recovery position, you're looking at, okay, we're now not trying to save somebody. We're not trying to put people at risk. Let's slow down and do it, get them out, you know, recover safely. So the emphasis switches from recklessness safely to safely with a little bit of recklessness. So the, the, the risk to reward benefits changes our perspective and the roles that engineers and firefighters play on a site quickly. Yeah, and I think it's really important to um, just kind of emphasize your work done with firefighters. I know it's like such an important part, especially in the first responding phase, because I remember there was um, a situation in Houston, which I'm, I am I lived in Houston before I lived in Dallas, and there was a story that I was talking to an engineer about, and it was a, a collapse due to fire of a, an inn. Um, in 2013 and the the responding engineer like <laughs> essentially caught the failure unfortunately there did some some people did get trapped so there was unfortunately loss of life but um, I remember there was like a huge discuss a discussion following um, about you know the work that the structural engin engineers do specifically for the first responding piece to help obviously the goal is to help to prevent something right. like that happening. Um, but, you know, you mentioned that, you know, your firm covers essentially all phases. So you cover first responding, second responding, and then what it sounds like the, essentially the repair work that comes about right. whenever you have a disaster. Um, can you talk to us about like how you would assess fire damage structures? Cause those I think are the most insidious because fire changes like the composition of materials significantly than what originally was designed. Um, and you know, what is called out for you as an STS? Yeah, so when we're doing the repair work, it's usually not with an S uh, first responder world. So we, we're basically become engineers. And as we're doing that, we're like, okay, do I need to get, how close do I need to get to evaluate stuff? So we do a little bit more of, you know, let's stand back. I don't need to be at that edge. I don't need to be tunneling through it. Far as fires, yeah, you have, you know, especially wood fires, you go from a charred level. Well, you look at the building code and your char ratings. And it's like, look, if I burn it for an hour, it's, I got two inches left of my, but if you have a two by four, your two inches is nothing. So you're, you're sometimes going into a building and going, yeah, I'm not sure how it's standing. It should have been on the ground because my load bearing wall is gone and your trusses are all melted and your deck's doing something funky. And you're like going, okay, it's standing. I'm not going to go stand on the second level. <laughs> I'm going to walk from the outside. I have a nice camera lens. I can zoom in to take pictures. And then we start evaluating, okay, all that comes out. You know, we kind of joke, we get existing drawings, one in 10 buildings. So as we get to a site and we ask the question, do you have an existing building? And they're all like, no. And you're like, yeah, I'm, that's kind of the standard answer is no. You know, when you get a get three of them in a row, you're like, no. great, next year I've got no building drawings at all. So so you're you're dealing with, you know, load bearing walls that are gone. Uh, and sometimes the funnier ones are just stuff that you wouldn't expect, like a car coming through the building of a fast food joint. The load bearing wall is gone. The bar, the roof trusses are just hanging there by the deck. And then I show up on site and the building inspector standing on the roof going, can you believe it's still standing? And you're like, yeah, I can believe it. But why are you standing on it? You know, it's, 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 it's quite a bit of live load on here. <laughs> you're kind of like, yeah, it's doing some type of funky tension and you're trusting nails and a contractor who did this building 20 years ago to, standing on it it's like that's not the best plan so as we're doing the 
this repair work, we're coming at this with, I don't need to be on that roof. I need to be doing the repairs from back here. If there was a reason the first responder world, I need to be on the roof, then we'll have a different conversation. So our level, again, as that reward goes back from risk to reward benefits, it becomes like, I don't need to be there. You know, uh, we've crawled through, you know, buildings, you know, knocked out glass to, to finish crawling through buildings to see how the damage is. There's been in buildings that I'm sitting there going, this shouldn't have stand to begin with. I don't know how it's, you know, so we're, we're trying to track the load path and it's a cantilever on a cantilever on a cantilever. And you're like going, okay, somehow the load path worked and they built it, but I'm not sure how. So you get some of those projects and you're just trying to put it back as best you can and, and dealing with that. Um, we actually had a job in Fort Myers that we haven't heard how it went because we were, were putting it back after a damaged storm recently as I in came in. So it may not be a building at all because it may be finished coming down because it was half built or half completed. So mm -hmm. we have to check in with our client down there still. I haven't heard from them yet. And I have a quick question about that. You know, you mentioned getting it back to the original design. So, you know, obviously certain buildings, you know, let's say it was built in the 1960s that has sort of a disaster happen to it. Do you have to, if there's a disaster, do you have to update the entire building, let's say to a new code, or is it just the renovation? You know, do you just analyze, you know, the damaged part or do you look at the entire structure? What does that look like? So each state has their own series of codes as we're all pretty much aware of these days, but the um, North Carolina has adopted the existing building code. Um, Georgia has as well. I think Florida, you know, Florida has, Alabama has, Virginia has. So they've adopted different sections of the codes, but the big kicker to this is in the existing building code, they have a assessment that you do. It says if you're less than 50% of the value of the tax value of the property, you don't have to do anything but repair it. So if it is, you know, especially if it's not a windborne disease. So a fire disaster, you just got to put it back the way it was. You don't have to meet the new codes as long as it's less than 50% of the value of the property. Mm -hmm. So obviously if it's a big building, it's a small fire, you're just putting back what's needs to go back. If it's a building that had a bit big fire, you may be now assessing it, but all you're now assessing it to put it back to meet current lateral or gravity codes and you're not dealing with lateral. Mm -hmm. Once you exceed the 50% rule, you're now kicking into, you know, the building departments can say, okay, are you in the floodplain? Are you in the wind zones? Are you in the seismic zones? And then they start going, okay, the, the more damage you're building, if you're damaged due to wind, you're going to bring it up to new wind. If you're damaged due to seismic, you're bringing it up to new seismic. If you're in a floodplain, you're bringing it up to floodplain requirements. So sometimes you're looking at these buildings and you're like, okay, I am in the floodplain, the building's damaged, I have to bring it up to flood requirements and you're like you know I, I can do certain things like bring the mechanical units up as a you know as with our MEP teams we build little platforms to set mechanical units on we can say okay well we gotta you know create walls that can flood away on a building now our walls are access points for water to come and go so you're dealing with a little bit more complications the more you go damaged by events so mm -hmm. it is kind of like a gradation and the building codes on it and uh i was curious about um kind of a follow-up to those uh i know for those of you that are listening on on podcast uh, scott has a, a picture in his background that shows uh you know buildings looks like it was ravaged by a tornado or some disaster could you talk a little bit about that i know we talked about it offline a bit but uh yeah, so the picture is uh, the picture is the pretty much the day after a EF four tornado hit Henryville School. It was a high, it was an all school, it was a middle school, high school, and elementary school. And uh, EF four, which was about 190 mile an hour winds, hit it directly on the one side. So we have school videos, but the way this job went, it was a, you know, it was definitely a recovery section. It was not a first responder. The uh, First responder teams out of uh, Kentucky had already responded to it and searched the school. Luckily, nobody was hurt in the school, believe it or not. The principal had enough warning to get every kid on buses and got out of there. 
they put three per seat and just told the bus drivers to drive. They didn't pay attention to what kid was on what bus. And so it took them eight hours to get all the kids home because they didn't know where the kids, you know, which bus the kid was on. So the parents were trying to figure out, you know, where the kids were and on what bus. But the uh, few teachers that were in it were in the right spot. So no, they weren't hurt. Um, wide flange beams, like a 36 inch wide flange beam was thrown probably 800 feet, you know, 60 feet long. And it went through the gym, you know, so we were dealing with the 200,000 square foot school varying from nothing gone to bent bar joist in the roof to walls collapse to doors being blown open. So we got there. Storm happened on a Friday. We got on site that Wednesday after the storm uh, at accelerated pace because the contractor we work with said, we're doing this by school year, getting this back open for a school year. So we found every drawing they building had, uh, sat overnight, drew it up. And then Friday morning, the week after the storm, we dropped off a set of demo plans to the contractor says, take all this out. We'll be back with real drawings later. Um, at an accelerated rate, five weeks after the storm, we had plans approved by the state to build back the school for the structures. The architects was two weeks behind us and MEPs were uh, about five weeks behind that because the school's like, well, since we got time, we need to look at new boilers and solar panels and new wiring. So they were upgrading the MEP systems as we were, you know, putting the building back together. So we are in a mad dash. I mean, we're, I don't, at the time, I think they were stealing bar joists from other jobs. They were like, okay, we're putting this back. We're going to go grab this bar joist. It works. You know, can we do a bigger size bar joist? And we're like, yeah, we can do a bigger size. You know, so it was a, you know, I think it was $65 million. It was a 24 seven operation build back. They had three project managers running lights. They had every meal catered on the site. So you didn't leave the site for when you got the site for your shift. Wow. And Five months later, that school was turned over for the kids to be open in school. And as a side note, we actually did the temporary school for them as they finished out the school year. Um, Lady Antebellum played their senior prom for you know fundraiser, so it was a big, uh, big disaster, a big event. So the community really got together for that one. That's really cool. Yeah, I think that's something that structural engineers may not get to experience too often because you know they're probably stuck in the office and doing their calcs but you know from your stories uh, you're actually going out there you're seeing the people who's you know this affected and actually making it i think you get to actually see the the importance of you know what structural engineers do and what they can do to help the community instead of just numbers it's you know it's the community and and uh the importance of that and uh, yeah, I just wanted to touch up on uh, there's got to be different skills from uh, communication skills. I imagine they what what type of skills like doing this type of responder work? I, I imagine you have to have great communication skills. Uh, you can't just be the engineer and just be like beams, columns, uh, et cetera. I think you got to have some you got to have maybe some empathy on what people are going through during these these times in the communication? Yeah, you got to recognize that, you know, as the engineer, you're, we kind of joke, you know, the search, search and rescue dogs are ahead of us in the org chart as a joke, you know, because, you know, they're, they're more important, <laughs> they're more likable. So we're just down there at the bottom. <laughs> um, but the, our roles as, a, you know, is so unique that we're like there and we're almost more interacting with the firefighters than the public because we're like, we're here to basically keep them safe and help them recognize where a person could be trapped, where the voids would be, where's the easy access points. So when we're looking at, we have a, on the North state level, we have our own tablets that the state provides us to have Wi-Fi signals. Uh, the, the task force team actually brings their own cell phone tower. So we can actually plug up a cell phone tower in, in like five minutes and have the site completely wired back to, you know, satellite or cell phones if they had cell phone tower issues. So we have tablets that are Wi-Fi enabled and, and cell phone enabled. So we can actually go there, take a picture, zoom in, draw on our little tablet, and then we can distribute it to the firefighters or they can you know, look at ours and they can see, take pictures. Our tablets are uh, real time with the North Carolina Emergency Management 
So as we tag a building that this is damaged or there's a victim here and we tag it as soon as we hit upload or push, they're seeing it come up on their screen. So they know real time where we are at, where people are at, what's been rescued, what's been cleared. You know, so on a wide area search, you see, you know, engineers and firefighters working together, running down the streets, doing, you know, five minutes of building, trying to find out, you know, what, you know, who just needs rescue, who needs assistance, filling out our little tablets, hitting buttons, push, 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 push. And they're just popping up all in North Carolina management. Um, the North Carolina Emergency Management thinks engineers need to know this information. So we actually gave us dashboard access. So we actually can see that live data as well. And we're like, I don't really want to be playing with this information, but thank you for letting us have this. So we have a, like a view of status now. So we can like, okay, so if a firefighter team in a wide area incident says, hey, this bridge needs to be looked at because we see cracks. Well, a firefighter's not going to know what to do with it. And, you know, you're not going to be able to call the DOT and say, I need a, an engineer to come out here. But the first responders are available. So they're like, hey, Scott, you're going to go over there to look at this bridge. And so we're obviously, you know, I'm a bridge guy, our building guys. I do, you know, anything from rooftop units to eight story, 10 story hospitals, wastewater treatment plants. So that's my normal day life. But yeah, we have a, a uh, Cheryl Lynn's with us and she's a, she's did bridges for a living for a while. So we have a hotline to her say, Cheryl Lynn, uh, I got a bridge here. I got this crack. I'm concerned with what am I looking at? What am I missing? Or if it's a dirt issue, we have a collapse. We have a geotechnical on, on our team and we call up Donnie. It's like, Donnie, I got a, you know, I got a, horizontal shear cracks in the dirt and I got a trench. Is this an issue? Do I, what do I do? I need to step, cut this back, you know? So as a team, as engineers, we have resources that, you know, we can quickly access. And when it becomes an emergency, we are basically all turn on our phones and we're all ready for whatever assistance we need from each other. So our communications is a little bit unique. In fact, at one point during Florence, the captain came up to me and goes, do you know where task force three is? I said, hold on. I called up, you know, the person engineer on task force three and said, they're over here in this school in this area. And he's like, great. Cause North Carolina emergency management lost them for a few minutes. Yeah. You know, it's like, okay, well, they're, they're fine. Don't worry about it. They're, you know, their engineers telling me where they're at. So we have the ability to, you know, communicate a little bit differently than the firefighters. Cause we have a little bit like a horizontal train between groups. Yeah. I think that communication is actually pretty cool, especially with, I think it's really interesting that you work with a team that has such a diverse amount of experience because, uh, I, you know, we just, you mentioned geotech. That was what I did in my past life. Um, you know, like working with trenches and worried about not just the structure, because that is important, obviously you want to protect it, but also the substructure is also very important. So, um, yeah, yeah no. I think that's really interesting. When we set up, when, you know, because I started, I, I was in the first wave of engineers to join the North Carolina Emergency Management. Donnie and Tom were the ones that basically said, hey, North Carolina Emergency Management, you need engineers. There's no way in the world you're going to find four engineers in every place you have a task force because Buncombe County at North Carolina is nowhere in the mountains and your closest city is Ash, Ashboro and they have like two engineering firms. So to find four engineers out there, you're not going to do it. He said, however, you can find 15, 20 in the state that are willing to do this. And it's four hours from state tip to state tip, almost any direction. So if you have a swap them in Charlotte, a swap them in Raleigh and in Greensboro and over the coast and the mountains, you get a few, then it's easy enough to say, Hey, Scott, you're in the middle of the middle of the state, head up to the mountains or, Hey, you go to the coast or so we can, self, you know, deploy, catch up the task force as they're going to wherever they need to go uh, pretty quickly. And then um, just kind of the end off here, um, do you have any final advice for, you know, engineers working on large scale disaster projects? Because I, you know, I find this kind of a unique position for structural engineers. It has a lot of really, you know, obviously disasters are not good things that happen, right. but it's, it's a very exciting um, you know, think on your feet kind of position you're in, which I think is, you know, a lot of maybe younger engineers or even engineers, because you just mentioned you have to have five years experience, right. um, but like medium tenured engineers um, who probably like the idea of thinking on their feet um, would be really interested in this. Yeah, this, this is definitely not for, you know, everybody, because you need 
think on your feet, you're really like, okay, I'm eyeballing loads. You're like trying to figure out, okay, if that pile of rubble is 20 pounds a square foot, because that's, you know, roughly what we've been learning, you know, that floor could take a hundred pounds a square foot. Well, that's now, you know, so you're taking what you know in the building code, you're taking what you know, it's out there in real life. And then you're trying to evaluate, is this a safe place? Is that beam overloaded? How badly is that beam? You know, is that shift point differently? You know, when it comes to rigging and that you're trying to figure out an unknown mass shape because it wasn't a, you know, it's no longer a rectangle. It's, it's some trapezoidal octagon three-dimensional shape that you're trying to figure out where's the center of gravity, where's the pick point to get that thing moved. Um, so it becomes a completely different, you know, you're definitely feeling like, okay, I'm eyeballing. It should be approximately there. And then you're going with it and you're spending, you know, you know, you're getting like five minutes at best to determine some of this stuff because you're not, you're not waiting for you to figure this out. If you wait, take too long. They're going to try something and hopefully it worked where you're really going to be a little better at it. So it's going to be a lot more pressure. We kind of joke that it's like hours and hours and hours of training and then five minutes of complete chaos and then back to hours and hours and hours of training. Mm -hmm. I mean, so it's not a, you know, I'm doing a disaster every day. I'm doing my normal five, nine to five job doing normal buildings and then going into the disaster zone. And you got to switch that hat to, I'm not worried about safety factors. I'm worried about how much I can avoid or, go into that safety factor mm-hmm. you know if i can wood has a safety factor of five i can push that wood now i know i can push that wood so I, that's where that experience comes into place is that that i can go a lot further than that two by four says it can go and that's where you start pushing that envelope a lot more for you know that 10 minute cycle to get somebody in and out quickly this stuff's uh just because you're the way you were saying it was kind of just uh the opposite intuition of engineers where we want to <laughs> analyze it and well, let me make sure like, give me a couple minutes to make sure and do my calcs right it's like no it's they're going they're going with or without you because uh you know someone's in need or or right. something is an emergency so yeah that's really interesting but this this whole conversation was was fascinating scott i just want to thank you for taking your time to uh to hop on and um and, you know talking about it because it is another aspect like you were talking about the the other programs that uh, the second responders that that uh, you know that engineers can volunteer to to help out with it in their own way. So uh, thanks again, and uh, thanks for coming on. Rob, well, thank you guys. I hope you enjoyed this episode today. We'd love to hear your feedback, comments, and or questions. To leave them, please visit structuralengineeringchannel.com. There you'll find a summary of the key points discussed in today's episode, which is episode number 89, as well as links to any of the resources, websites, or books mentioned during this episode. Don't forget to subscribe to Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your podcast. Until next time, we wish you the best in all of your structural engineering endeavors.